Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, warshippers of all ages, welcome back to YouTube. My name is C Raptor, and today, guys, it is time we got started with another Learn to Play series, and I have settled finally on doing one on the Japanese destroyer line, specifically the Japanese torpedo centric branch of the destroyer line. When World of Warships released, of course, there were only two lines of destroyers in the game. You had the Japanese and the Americans, and that's been a very, very long time, well over eight years at this point. And in that era, the Japanese were basically known as the torpedo boats, and the Americans were known as the gunboats. The game has matured, obviously, lots has changed, but at the end of the day, the Japanese destroyer line, which has been reorganized at least once, they did that when they brought out the gunboats, I think in the back end of 2016, sounds about right, might have been early 2017, but when they brought in um, the Akizuki, um, uh, Kitakaze, and Harugamo branch at the top of the line, they reorganized things a bit, shuffled things around, and basically you have kind of two parallel branches of the Japanese destroyer line starting at tier 5. The "quote unquote" left hand one in the in the uh, in the tree in the tech tree is the torpedo centric branch, starting here with tier five's Mutsuki, continuing up through Fubuki, Akatsuki, Kagero, Yugimo, and of course everyone's favorite tier ten destroyer, Shimakaze. So that's the line that we're going to look at here, guys, because there's a lot to take in, there's a lot to absorb, there's a lot you can learn about destroyer play in general from playing this line of ships. It's something that I don't think I'd considered until very recently. I went back and was thinking, you know, kind of how did I learn destroyer? How did I figure this out? And it really goes back to so much of my time that I spent in old tier five Minikaze back in that era, right back in late 2015, early 2016, um, in the middle tiers with, in that era, Minikaze was well and truly busted. I mean, she was grossly OP. Uh, she's been through a number of nerfs since then. She's in a much better place balance wise. But um, I learned a lot and I'm going to see if I can help translate some of that into, into these videos. And, and then what the lessons that you can learn in the Japanese destroyer line apply in so many other places, particularly with torpedoes, how to use them, how to maximize them, um, how to lead them. And there's a lot, there's a lot we can talk about. So let's get into it. Let's not spend a ton of time here. We're going to start obviously here at tier five. Now down here at tier five, you're not expecting a, an immensely capable destroyer. But I think Mutsuki will surprise you. It certainly did me as I started to make these videos. My memories of Mutsuki are mostly cent centered around back in the day when she was the tier six destroyer in the Japanese destroyer line. This was, again, six, seven years ago. And I despise the ship in that era. In fact, if I went and looked at my stats for Mutsuki in that era, um, I think I would discover they were terrible terrible because I was as good as I was with Minikaze Mutsuki was a huge step backwards for Minikaze and she got more challenging opponents but by dropping Mutsuki down a tier here at tier five and putting her alongside Minikaze in the tech tree she offers something a little different and I actually think this is a very very capable ship in the modern game and uh, let's talk about why all right so as we do we'll start with survivability now you see there, I'm looking at 11,300 hit points. That is not without survive that don't have survivability survivability expert on this captain. And we'll talk about why that is later, because in general, that's my default three-point skill for most destroyer builds. But we're going to talk about I've started to take a little different tack on how I build this Japanese destroyer captain. So that is Mutsuki's base health. Um, that is honestly, it's a little on the low end, but it's not worst in tier. Uh Visby still exists. But it is on the low side. Most tier five destroyers have more health than you. Now, the overwhelming majority of them don't have a tremendous more health, uh, tremendous amount of more HP than you. Most of them are in the 12, 12 ish thousand range. So you're you're maybe about let's just rough it call ballpark and call it about 10 percent off the pace when it comes to an average health. But you're going to make up for that in other areas, so don't feel so terrible. The big bully in this tier, uh, certainly in the tech tree, of course, is the, is the French. Uh, Jaguar coming in at over 16,000 HP base. By the time you pump that ship up, she can, cut, she can get close to 18,000 health. That is crazy for a tier 5 destroyer. That's definitely a ship you do not want to run into. Um, but beyond that, most other destroyers you'll run into have approximately um, your health, but you are at a disadvantage here, so keep that in mind. Um... Maneuverability and concealment. I mean, I could talk about armor, but it, we, we know how this conversation goes. 
LOL, you're a destroyer. You have no armor. So just, I'm not even going to waste my time with it. Um, okay. So two things here that I want to point out that Mutsuki does really well. One is her top speed. You see there, uh, 39.4 knots with a flag. That I think her top speed without it is probably around 37 and change. Um, that is not best in tier because uh, Poitavisky and Minakazi still exist, but it's definitely on the high end, right? You're very much among the fastest destroyers at the tier. That's good because that, that's going to enable you to pr hopefully, much of the time, outrun the ships that you don't want to engage in a gunfight. Uh, 2.1 on the rudder shift, 550 on the turning circle. This ship handles very, very well. These are not best in tier numbers for a mid-tier destroyer. And tr truth be told, they're pretty average. Um, but uh, you've got plenty of handling. The ship will turn when you need it to. Don't worry about it. The key number I want you to take away, the, the single, probably single biggest asset that this ship has is that detection number. Look at that stealth. 5.4 detection on the surface at tier 5. That is absolute insanity. There are tier 8, 9, and 10 ships in this line that don't get this kind of stealth. They get close, but they don't get this stealth. This is a massive asset because when you combine with this detection with the speed that you have, again, it's not best in tier, but it's really good, it allows Mutsuki to decide which engagements she's going to accept and which ones she's going to turn and run away from. The ships that you are really, really afraid of in your tier, things like we talked about Jaguar. I would also look. I would also consider both American destroyers. That's Nicholas and her premium cousin Hill. They have a tremendous amount of gunfire power. You can see those guys coming. In some cases, by more than a more than a kilometer, depending on the ship, right? And so that is huge, absolutely huge. And it's it's even more critical because Mutsuki will very commonly, of course, find herself in tier six and seven games where nobody, nobody in those brackets has this kind of stealth. The closest, I think, is maybe uh, Tier 7 Premium Haida comes in at 5.5. Um, I think that's the closest actual gunboat destroyer that can that can get, you know, can get that close to you. And you still have a small spotting advantage. So if you get a, you open a game with a Haida, you got to be frosty. But just about everybody else, you have a noteworthy spotting advantage against. I cannot emphasize this enough. This is something that you need to learn at Tier 5. You've got to learn, and, and it's, this is a skill that's going to serve you well through the rest of the Japanese line, and frankly, anytime you play Destroyer. So this is a great place to learn it at Tier 5, where, frankly, I'm, if I'm honest, nobody expects anything out of a, a Tier 5 Destroyer, right? When I zone into a game in a cruiser or a battleship, and there's Tier 5 and 6 Destroyers rolling around, my full expectation is that all of them will be dead within six minutes. And so if you're able to get to where you can pilot a mid-tier Destroyer with this kind of detection, this kind of speed and last in a game 10, 12, 15 minutes, you have developed the skills that you need to manage this detection and use it what it's meant to do. What is it meant to do? Well, it's meant to enable you to make stealthy torpedo attacks on opposing ships, okay? We'll get to this in a minute, but while we're here talking about concealment, Mutsuki's concealment, uh, I'm sorry, Mutsuki's torpedo range is eight kilometers. So you have a nice, comfortable gap in there to play with between your detection range and your torpedo range. But more importantly, it allows you to spot for your team, right? This kind of detection means that you can, you can spot an opposing destroyer on the surface and not risk your own ship. And if, as long as your teammates will wake up and shoot that guy, you are doing the team an amazing service. Of course, you frequently will be able to spot larger prey as well. But, but generally, your ability to outspot opposing destroyers while your teammates murder them is a two-way win-win. They get damage, so, and, and, and for you, you're getting rid of targets that are threats to you, and it's just, it's, it, everybody wins, right? So this is a very, very key skill. Learning to use the det this detection to your advantage is one of the best things that you can spend time in in Mutsuki. I would strongly encourage you, if you're learning destroyer play, pick up this ship, and play the hell out of it. Or Minikaze, really. I mean, the, the Minikaze is very similar. Most of what I'm saying about the detection and the speed and everything would apply to Minikaze as well. But if you want to focus on the torpedo side of the line, this is a good place to start. And just play the crap out of this ship until you can, as I said, live in a game for a while, right? Survive to the 10, 12, 15 minute mark of a match reliably, comfortably, right? Because you don't have radar in these tiers. No one can forcibly detect you outside of you screwing up and getting spotted on the surface. 
or I guess hydro technically as well. But again, you have to let them close to you for that hydro to work. I think the max range you can get of hydro in her matchmaking bracket is probably about five-ish kilometers. I think some of the German hydros go to five or maybe even five and a half, depending on the ship. But the bottom line is, is that you have to be, you have to really screw up your position to get forcibly spotted in Mutsuki. So definitely, definitely spend the time and learn how to use that detection to your advantage. And you will see it, it, the game will finally now, we've talked about this in other videos, right, will finally reward you for all that spotting damage, and you'll see good XP results out of it. Let's talk about Mutsuki's offensive uh, capabilities. She has, well, she has a main battery. It is not amazing. Mutsuki has two single-barrel 120 millimeter guns. She has one on the bow and one on the stern. These guns have a five and a half second reload. That is terrible. It is significantly better than most other Japanese destroyers. This is a nod to the fact that she only has two barrels. These guns are not great. And you'll see me talk about this throughout the line, that you have to remember that your Japanese destroyer has guns. And even on Mutsuki, I want you to remember that your Japanese destroyer has guns. But on Mutsuki in particular, I want you to acknowledge that you really shouldn't be firing them unless you are have no other options. In other words, you're getting pushed by something that is good, that is forcibly spotting you and you might as well, or you have the opportunity to finish off an opposing ship that is very, very low. Uh, you know, if you've got an opposing destroyer, he's under a thousand HP and you can see him, man, give it a shot. Two, three salvos. He's probably gone, right? He's probably out because these shells hit decently hard. You just don't throw that many of them and they don't go, they don't throw them. You don't throw them all that fast. Okay. So it's not what the ship does well, but the main battery is here. Something else worth pointing out. You only have an 8.9 kilometer main battery range. It's a blessing and a curse. The blessing is that, I mean, the curse is that you can't fire, you know, you have to get pretty close to somebody to use your guns. But the blessing is, is that assuming that no, no one else is inside that bubble when you kill an opposing destroyer that might be spotting you, you're not spotted anymore. This is a benefit of the Italian destroyers that we've talked about in video comments and such, right? It's enough of a bonus that you might seriously consider... Is there a gun range module? There is. You might seriously consider never researching this gun range module and just live with the 8-kilometer range on the guns because it me it just makes you just that much harder to detect after you fire your guns. So, you know, I have it equipped here. If you don't want to spend the XP or the cash and you're just trying to grind through the ship, I would honestly say these are totally valid case to never take this gun module. So keep that in mind when you're spending XP on upgrades, okay? Um, torpedoes. Of course, this is really what you're here for. Mutsuki has two triple torpedoes. One here, bizarrely, just forward of the bridge, and the other one back here, all the way after the stacks, just forward of her after turret. These uh, torpedoes, these torpedoes start with, I think, about a 60, what is it? What's the base? 76 second reload? I have 76 in my sheet, but that feels a little long. I think they've lowered it a bit. Um, eight kilometers range, 14 and a half thousand alpha, and they start with a speed of 60, 63 knots, 63 knots. These are really good torpedoes. These are not quite best in tier in terms of torpedo damage, but they're very, very close. They're right behind the French, um, who get also get eight kilometer torpedoes that hit very, very hard, almost this hard, but they have a they have a much longer reload, okay? And then, of course, the deep water torpedoes that the Pan-Asian destroyer gets, that Zhenwei, uh, she gets, those torpedoes hit harder, but they hit fewer targets because they're deep water torpedoes. They cannot hit destroyers. These are, of course, the infamous Japanese 610 millimeter diameter uh, torpedoes. Most destroyers, most destroyers of most navies mount torpedo diameters of 533 millimeters. The Japanese believed very, very seriously in torpedo doctrine, torpedo attacks, especially night torpedo attacks. And so they took the time to develop larger, longer range, heavier hitting torpedoes. And that is one of the features of the line that you are playing. Now you can see there, um, the reload here on mine, 58 and a half seconds. So you can buff these. I believe I've got the captain's skill, three point captain skill knocks it down by 10%. And, and so you can get these down just under 60 seconds, which for these torpedoes is pretty good. Eight kilometers of range is nice. It's a little better than her other tech tree compatriot, Minikaze, which is capped out at seven kilometers. The trade-off is, is that your torpedoes are a little more detectable. They are 1.6 kilometers uh, detection radius versus I think Minikaze's are like 1.2 or something. They're harder to spot. Yeah, yeah. So Minikaze's torpedoes are a little slower, but they're a little, they're not quite as easy to spot, whereas Mutsuki's are a little easier to spot, but they are faster. 
Um, these are really good. She has great torpedo angles. You generally you can you can generally get at least one launcher off. Probably I'm, I'd have to pull. I'll put the, I'll put the, the uh, images up here, and I'm not looking at it right now. But I'm guessing probably about thirty to thirty five degrees off the bow. Uh, the stern angle is going to be a little worse just because of all the superstructure. You can see here the forward launcher it really is going to struggle to traverse much much uh, aft of the. Uh, uh, the mid mid midship's line of the ship, whereas the the forward launcher, this aft launcher has probably got pretty good angles forward and pretty terrible angles uh, towards the aft. But um, but yeah, uh, the torpedoes are excellent. Um, now let's while we're here talking about like learning destroyer, let's take a brief aside and go look at um, kind of torpedo torpedo ranges and how they plow some basic geometry plays into World of Warships. All right, guys, so real briefly here, I'm going to open up MS Paint, <laughs> and we're going to do a little bit of kind of Torpedo Geometry 101. This is something that I think, it took me a while to kind of wrap my brain around this, which is a little frustrating, frankly, as an engineer, but I did finally get there, and I want to make sure that everybody understands this, because it's really critical when you start trying to figure out how to lead torpedoes on certain targets. So let's assume for a minute, this is my little Mutsuki here in the middle. This black circle around me represents my torpedo range. And you can put this up on the mini map so you can very clearly see the torpedo range, you know, that little bubble, that little ring around your ship, which is super handy. I love the mini map. So let's assume then that I want to be shooting at, uh, let's pick, let's just say it's a big, fat, dumb battleship, right? Let's say he's out here. I got to make a couple of adjustments here. There we go. Now, that's not going to look like a battleship icon because it's paint. But let's just assume that this guy down here is my target. Now, let's just say for a minute he is, uh, let's just say he is 9.5 kilometers away. Just for the hell of it. We'll just pick an arbitrary number. I'm just kind of making this up as I go, right? So congratulations. This guy is 9.5 kilometers from me. Outside my torpedo range, correct? Sure. But one of the things you can do on the mini map, right? And when you can have, you can set it up so that when you have an enemy ship targeted, he's got a little line in front of him that'll look like this. That'll show you the course that he's on. Okay, now it won't reflect his speed, right? You don't know how fast he's moving. You can assume by, you know, you learn over experience to kind of judge a ship and say, okay, he's moving, looks like he's moving full speed, right? Depending on what he's doing. But you can see what course he's on, and you can see where that line intersects your torpedo bubble, your torpedo circle. So right now, this guy's outside of my range. But when I when I put when I lock him up with the cursor, right? I, I put my, my I put my cursor on him and I hit X to lock in that target. What the game will do is it will show me a predicted torpedo curve, a predicted torpedo path. And if I line my visual, uh, uh, you know, my cursor, uh, my aiming cursor up with that, that line will also appear on the mini map. Like, so let's assume it was something like this. Okay. So this line, actually, let me, let me change the color of this line. Let's change it to gray. So, and we'll change, I can't change the battleship one. So this black line represents the battleship's current course. And this gray line represents where the game is predicting. I have to aim for my torpedoes to intersect him. You can see right there, it would be, I'm going to draw a little circle around it if I can here, right? It would be right about there. Okay, I screwed that up because it's Phil. <laughs> there we go. So right there would be where, where my torpedoes would land. But I can already tell just by looking at it that that's not going to work, right? Because that circle, that intersect point is outside my torpedo range. So I know that firing my torpedoes right now will not result in hits. Those torpedoes will run out shy of his hull. But what happens if I lead a target like this and the game tells me, oh, that, that line actually looks like this. And so now you can see, right, depending on his speed and everything, that the intersect point is now inside my torpedo radius. It's right there, isn't it? It's just barely inside but it's inside. So this is something that I, I want you to try and work on learning to look at the mini map to help predict some torpedo, some maybe some crazy shots, right? Because again, ordinarily I would lock onto this battleship knowing my torpedo range is eight kilometers, look at him and go, he's outside my torpedo range. 
but maybe he's really not. Maybe he's actually not. Spend an extra 5, 10, 15 seconds, line up the cursors, look at the mini-map, and decide for yourself if that torpedo salvo has a chance in hell of landing. Because sometimes if he's driving towards, this is particularly true of ships that are driving towards you. If he's moving away from you, you're hosed. Your torpedoes are not going to catch him, right? But if he's moving towards you, those torpedoes might find their way into your torpedoes range, even though when you launched those torpedoes, the target you launched them at was outside of his range, outside of your range. By the time those torpedoes travel those eight kilometers, he has now moved into that envelope and they will land. So keep that in mind. A little bit of simple geometry here when you're playing uh, torpedo centric destroyers might land you some extra hits. Okay, guys, so with our little torpedo launching lesson aside, we'll move on. I hope you hope you learned something there. That's definitely something that you've got to you've got to learn to master in these ships, but it's a skill that applies in literally any destroyer you play that has a, torpedoes of a decent decent range. Depth charges. This is again hilariously something else that the Japanese do quite well. You see there, you've got 4,600 base damage on the depth charges. This is not best in the game, right? The Americans and the Brits still cap out a little over 5k, but you are right behind. The Americans, the British, and the Japanese have the hardest hitting depth charges in World of Warships. So if you're able to corner an opposing submarine, you can inflict tremendous pain on him in very, very short amount of time. It's something that I think a lot of players forget about the Japanese destroyers. Now, of course, you're only putting four bombs down in a, in a, in a, in a stick, which at this tier feels pretty bad, but at the same time, most of the submarines you're going to be fighting are going to be tier six ones, and they're not, well, all of them. You can't see a tier eight sub in your matchmaking. And so, you know, you're, those most of those have got around 10, 12,000 HP. Um, you're you're going to do a significant chunk of his damage if he takes all of those. Uh, but definitely don't forget about these, right? Your stealth combined with these hard-hitting depth charges means that you are a pretty good submarine hunter when you are afforded the opportunity to be such. And you're going to see some of that in the sample game that we've got coming in a little bit. A defense, LOL. This is, this is a song we're going to be singing throughout the entire line. The Japanese destroyers, especially the torpedo destroyers, do this very badly. So, you know, we've taught, we've done the Japanese heavy cruiser videos. If you've watched those, pretty much none of the Japanese cruisers have. You have to get to the very, very top of the line before you get to, like, mediocre AA, right? So imagine that same philosophy of you have bad anti-aircraft fire applied to ships that can't mount very many anti-aircraft guns because they don't have the deck space or the, the top sides wait for it. Welcome to the Japanese destroyer line. You have enough anti-aircraft fire to murder um, fighters that get dropped over your head, right? So when an opposing carrier flies over you and dumps a fighter over you to try to keep you lit, turn your AA on, blow him out of the water, you know, shoot down the planes, turn your AA back off. Leave it off as much as you possibly can. One thing that you've seen, if you've watched me play destroyer, I haven't really talked about this in videos, but your aerial detection is very, very, very low. This is very true in the Japanese destroyers. 2.3 kilometers is incredibly low aerial detection. Most of these ships, the aerial detection is around in the 2.3 to 2.5 range. Those, most carrier planes are too quick for them to reliably get a strike off on you in that amount of time. In the amount of time, especially if you're if you're sailing at the planes at, let's say, 35 knots, and he's coming at you at 150 knots, and there's 2.3 kilometers, and when he detects you, he doesn't have time to execute an attack. You have to really screw up, or he has to get very lucky with predicting where you're going to be in order for him to do that. So in these ships, most of the time, you'll see me turn my AA off and leave it off, and that is the best thing that you can be doing. For those of you that don't know, that's the P key on your keyboard when you zone into a match. Hit P, turn your AA off, and leave it there in a Japanese destroyer. You can thank me later. It's a much, it's it's far, far, far better than uh, than trying to shoot down attacking aircraft. Um, all right, let's have a look at modules and all the rest. So we talked earlier, right? You're going to want the gun upgrade module because the reload time on the base guns is terrible. So get the gun upgrade and obviously get the hull upgrade. But I think there's a valid case to be made for skipping out on the range, the gun range upgrade if you if you want to. Don't feel bad if you don't spend that. I think I think it's actually not a bad call to skip out on this. Um, Upgrade-wise, you're looking at main armaments one, in slot one, engine room in slot two, and I would strongly encourage you to put torpedo tubes modification in slot three. I mean, is there other things you could do? You could take church reverse. Please don't do this. This is terrible. The AA is bad. We just talked about this. Aiming systems mod would allow your torpedo tubes to traverse a little quicker, but the other advantage of this is it makes your guns a little more accurate, but you don't really want to be using your guns, right? So just don't do that. Um, if you've got the coal and you want the engine boost mod back here in slot two, totally viable pick. 
Um, you can you can do that if you want. I just think the injury and protection is a better a, a safer play, right? That way, for the odd times you do get spotted, it can happen. Now, I will say this: because you're so stealthy, and because you are more likely to be able to control the engagement and avoid taking gunfights against things you don't want to fight, engine boost might actually be a good pickup. So that's up to you. But uh, I don't have it on this ship just to save a little bit of money and a little bit of coal. Um, flags, obviously, we've gone um, anything that pumps my flood chance. For some reason, I'm running this India X-ray flag. I wouldn't do that, actually. Take the flood chance flags for your torpedoes. I would skip out on this for the moment, again, because Mutsuki's guns are just not really worth it most of the time. We get to up, we get farther up the line, the destroyers get better guns. We'll talk more about India X-ray, but it, down here at Tier 5, I wouldn't fool with it. Um, the Ember Foxtron, if you've got it, would be a good one. I'll slap that one on here. You definitely want Sierra Mike, and if you've got the Juliet Charlies, I would highly encourage it. But the flag demands here on the Japanese destroyer line is pretty low, right? Like, you can get by without Sierra Mike or November Foxtrot or Juliet Charlie. If you've got the flood flags, take them. But if you don't have them, you'd probably be fine without them anyway. You could, you could, you could actually run this ship without any signals at all, and it would perform pretty comparably. So Sierra Mike is probably the one that I would strongly encourage you to pick up. That extra speed is always, always, always good. But the rest, definitely optional. Commander skills. This is something that... As I started to get down, sit down to make these videos, I spent some time with my chat and we talked through some things on Twitch and I, I changed my opinion on certain ships in the line. And we're going to talk about them as we go. Mutsuki here is one. Ordinarily, as you know from, if you've watched my American Destroyer videos, my default recommendation for your first four skills in any Destroyer Captain would be Preventive Maintenance, Last Stand, Survivability Expert, and Concealment Expert. That's 10-point Captain. Pretty easy. Nice, reliable build. But... We've been talking about how amazing Mutsuki's detection is, how basically very, very few ships can even come close to this detection, how you should you should reliably, once you have, you know, some skills and some, you know, experience under your belt, you'll be able to reliably control engagements such that you probably aren't getting shot at a whole lot. That really reduces the value of survivability expert, right? Survivability expert is a skill that, like, if you expect to get detected, you're going to find yourself in gunfights. If you know you're going to take damage... This is a great skill because this can mean the difference between an eight minute game and a 10 or a 12 minute game, uh, depending on depending on how well you play. But if you don't intend to get in gunfights and you don't really want to get spotted and so on and so forth, there's and, and you're not in a tier with radar. Right. There's a valid case to be made for skipping the skill altogether. And that's what I've done here on Mutsuki. So instead, I opted for fill the tubes as my three point skill, because I consider that to be more important on this ship. And then um after that, I took turret traverse because why not? You could just as easily take a liquidator. Um, I could probably still take that here. I've only got I've only got 18 points put into this captain. Now I've got RPF down here as a four point skill. Traditionally, over the years, I have never our radio location. I call I still call it RPF, which was his original name was called radio position finding. I traditionally over the years, I don't think very highly of this skill. However. I am coming around to my to changing my opinion a little bit again on destroyers that have this kind of stealth because more than being it's a skill that kind of works two different ways right it allows it gives you offensive options in other words if I'm if my uh, radio location is pointing in a certain direction and I believe there's a destroyer over there I can vomit torpedoes out and maybe get lucky but it's also a defensive skill if a if a just if you know I if I've got my amazing detection this radio location might give me an indication of where an incoming destroyer might be coming from and would allow me to get my ship turned and angled away from that position such that when the guy does push into my his, his detection range, I'm already running away from him rather than having to turn and possibly get spotted while I get angled to, to get away. So I started experimenting with this skill on certain destroyers. If you have a captain down here at Tier 5 that can take this skill, I would encourage it. Try it out. Play around with it, especially if you're somebody like me who's never really messed with it a lot or hasn't messed with it much. Uh, and I think there's some value in it, okay? But if you have a brand new captain, it's a 10-pointer. Don't worry about this. Pick this up later. Focus on the offensive skills. And, of course, Adrenaline Rush uh, among those, right? I would honestly take... I would take RP, I would take RPF before I took Dirt Traverse, but I would take it after I took Adrenaline Rush. If you ask me what order I would go, I'd say one, uh, Prevent a Maze first, then Last Stand, then Fill the Tubes, then Conceal an Expert then come back for Adrenaline Rush, then grab Radio Location, and then maybe go back for Grease the Gears or Liquidator or Swift Fish or something like that. Something down here where you're boosting your offensive capability a little bit. That extra 5% right at the very end, that kind of thing. 
All right, guys. Well, listen, there's our tour of Mutsuki. Let's go look at some gameplay, and let's see how we put all this into practice. All right, welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to our sample game in Tier 5 Japanese Destroyer Mutsuki as we spawn into the top side of Neighbors. We are bottom tier this game, but as we were talking about earlier, kind of looking over the ship, for Mutsuki, that is not as big a catastrophe as you might think, right? Because look across the opposing destroyer lineup, you outspot, this ship outspots everybody on that team with the exception of the lone Minikaze. You have a 5.4 detection on the surface, the Minikaze can challenge you, everybody else you're going to see coming for at least a half a kilometer, if not more. So it's going to allow you to dictate which engagements you're willing to accept and which ones you are going to voluntarily uh, beat feet or run the hell away from. <laughs> now, spawning here on the A flank, I immediately turn towards mid. One of the things that I like to do as a Japanese destroyer is that in my experience, they perform better, they play better in open water. And on neighbors here, that means I'm gonna try to gravitate towards the center, towards this area between the A and the B cap. My torpedoes have an 8km range, they're looking for big, long angles at incoming targets, and with all of this open water, I have plenty of places that I can potentially run should I get caught out or get myself into a situation where it's like, okay, it's time to smoke and get the hell out of here, I need to go. Now, I'm going to pause the game real quick, because one other thing that I'm doing that I perhaps wouldn't ordinarily do, and you're certainly not going to see me do it in later tiers because of all the radar you might run into, but here at Tier 5, I know I'm not looking at potentially any radar. Um, I'm aggressively pushing up across what would ordinarily be the midpoint of the map. Imagine a diagonal line drawn through, I'm going to pull the cursor up here, diagonally across the board, right? Right through from here, from J1 on the bottom left, all the way through to A10 in the top right, right through the middle of each cap circle. So that's like the midpoint of the map, right? Now, this particular game in Mutsuki, I know that I have a big spotting advantage over just about everybody. So I'm aggressively moving forward in a way that you won't see me do in, in higher tier games. But I'm doing it here for two reasons. One, as I mentioned, I want the spotting damage. And two, if you look right here, I'm going to click on the mini-map. Eh, it won't let me. But right here in the, in, the, in the kind of the lower left, maybe if I unpause it, right? No, but in the in the in this in the far eastern corner of the B cap, right there where I'm clicking right now, there we go. That little green dot. I want to be able to get torpedoes into that spot, right? Because that's a very common spot for opposing destroyers. Now my RPF is right out here in front of me. So my expectation is that maybe then perhaps the opposing destroyer that I'm out here seeking has sort of opted to play along the bottom of the cap rather than go into that little alcove that I was uh, highlighting a moment ago. But as you're going to see in a moment, it's actually a twofer. My RPF is not picking up a destroyer. It's picking up something I don't expect, and that is the opposing submarine. This is something that didn't occur to me in the middle of the match, so I'm pointing it out now so that hopefully it occurs to you when you run into this situation in a later game. As it is, I'm now blocking the cap. I'm trying to kind of get my guns turned, get my hull turned. I know now that that must be the Minikaze over there. Anybody else I would have picked up already. Um, the opposing Mahan has bought it up at sea, and yep, sure enough, there's the Minikaze. Now, he's going to smoke immediately, and there we go. There we go. Already, I'm pinged by the opposing submarine. So here we are, less than three minutes into the game, and I'm about to have the most important engagement of the entire match. So we're going to pause a couple of points and talk through it. For starters, I know that Minikaze is there. I've got an Exeter. You can see him on the mini-map. He's just over my starboard aft quarter. He's going to be coming in to help me with that Minikaze. So my focus right now is twofold. One, I want to put torpedoes into this smoke in the hopes that maybe the Minikaze will blunder into one, because why not? And two, I'm going to get down here and make this submarine's life hell, because he has chosen something very, very, very not smart, and that is to ping and let... An opposing destroyer know that he is there. This guy's like three kilometers away from me when that first ping comes up. Three or four, and it's like, dude, that is that is not that is not a good idea. Now the first the first rack of four is gonna come up with nothing, but the second rack of four are all gonna land home. And because these are the big Japanese depth charges, that's a 6k hit. Now that Undine has barely 10,000 hit points, maybe just a smidge under. I just took away over half his HP. 
Now, I'm going to pause it again, because now we're in a bit more of a pickle, right? The opposing Minikaze has left his smoke. I didn't hit him with a torpedo, obviously. Um, the Exeter is going to start poking, you know, poking him uh, for fun and games. But now I'm caught out. I'm caught on the surface by the Minikaze, literally the only thing on the opposing team that can spot me. So I'm going to smoke. I want to, my goal is to, I want to break the line of sight. I don't want these ships off to my port side on the mini map down at the bottom of the five line, the Colorado, the Omaha, the Trento. I want none of those guys to take a pot shot at me and cost me too much health too early. So I'm blowing a smoke here to preserve my HP. But I, now that I've passed the submarine and you can see him pinging right there on the surface right behind me, I've got to get flipped around and come help the Exeter with that guy. So that's my next play. I'm trying to get my guns kind of flipped here. Mutsuki's guns are very slow to traverse, almost as slow as they are to fire. The Exeter there takes a good solid hit, I think from the Colorado. I'm slowly making this turn. I'm trying to deny the opposing Minikaze as much spotting as I can in there. He's now on fire, and I'm now outside my detection radius, so I can move back into the cap. You see the smoke slick, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the oil slick there in front of me tells me exactly where the opposing Undine is. He's right underneath me going to put another rack into the water as we're going to pick up the killing blow on the opposing Minikaze and wait for these depth charges to go in and we're going to wipe out what little bit of health the opposing Undine had left. There you go, less than five minutes for a quick double strike. That feels pretty nice, don't it? Especially when you can bag the cockroach. I mean, submarine. <laughs> Anytime you can bag an opposing cockroach, life is good. Okay, so... Now, looking at the strategic situation, the team has not exactly covered itself in glory. We've surrendered the B cap and the C cap, and so now we're going to grab B and try to make up some ground. The opposing Hiei here, I'm trying to figure out how to lead these torpedoes. I realize he's probably not going to keep pushing into me as the Colorado wipes out the Exeter behind me, and so sure enough, he starts to turn a little bit. I'm going to lead those torpedoes in the hopes that he is going to turn into those. My RPF has just flopped over. You just caught it there, so now... The Farragut is now the closest thing to me. He's over here off my port side, and there he is. I've got him lit on the surface because I have a huge spotting advantage on that guy. His base surface detection, I think, is about 6'6", 6 6'4", 6 6 6 6 something like this. I outspot him by nearly a kilometer. He cannot sneak up on me. That is not happening. We're going to finish the B cap, wait for these torpedoes to go in on the uh, the opposing Hiei, and uh, yep, that's going to be a nice pickup here in a moment. He's going to take two of those right on the belt, for about 20k, a quick tick of flood, and a dead battleship. battleship Farragut looking like maybe he's trying to push me a bit. Gets within a few hundred meters of being able to spot me. As my team starts shelling him, he decides, nope, nope, nope. He's had enough of that. He starts to back off. So already with three kills, not even six minutes into the game, and now my role is a little calmer. Let's talk about it briefly. What was I worried about at the start of the game? The opposing Minikaze was the only thing that could spot me, outspot me, or equally spot me. He is dead. So now, my main roles are cap control, uh, area denial, and spotting for the team, because nobody can sneak up on me, right? So, Friendly Almirante Cochran over here down on the three line is about to push into the A cap. There he goes. I want to get over here and help him while trying to maneuver into position to put torpedoes downrange on this Colorado. I'm sort of expecting the Colorado to turn around, but until he, start, until he does, I'm going to assume that he's going to continue to push in. Now, my torpedoes only have an eight-kilometer range. I was trying to cut the run time there by pushing in perhaps a little closer than I would need to. But unfortunately, I screwed this salvo up. I didn't realize that at the time the Colorado has already started turning out. I should have led those a little differently, but that's fine. I'm going to get into this cap. I'm going to help out the Cochrane, and we are going to pick up A uh, for a little more board control. We're still down a ship here. Not quite seven minutes gone, and um, still trying to find a way kind of back into the game. But not Certainly, certainly uh, not having a lead right now, and uh, going to have to work on that. So with the A-cap complete, the Colorado running, my play now is I'm going to continue to play this gap in between A and B. Again, open water. This is where I can be the most effective. And I've still got a few ships around to help me thump this Farragut, who I still have a significant spotting advantage over. So now I'm going to move back to B on the assumption the Farragut's going to try to steal that away from me. And um, I'm not going to. I have no intention of allowing for that. My team is continuing to put damage downrange on the Colorado. RPF now tracking the Farragut's location. You can see there he's just edging into the cap up here off my starboard bow, and there he is. 
So now that he's lit on the surface, the Heinrich secondaries are going to start to go in on him. He's going to have to, to kind of tail away there, angle away from me. I'm having to thro toggle my throttle. If I keep moving at him at full speed, he's going to know exactly where I am, and I don't want that. I want him to have to guess where I am. Now that I'm in the cap, there's no way he'll complete it. Trento is going to smoke and stop back there. I'm going to lead these torpedoes on the assumption that the Trento is going to sit there. But of course, he's not going to sit there. So those will miss. But they're going to, they would potentially punish him if he chose to sit there. The trick is right now, I'm spotting him through his smoke because he had fired. Farragut now opening up on the surface, realizing that he cannot escape my, uh, my little detection games that I'm playing back here. As the Trento pulls out of his smoke at full speed, he's chugging ahead. They're about to finish off the Colorado as the opposing Omaha, circling down here from the C cap, is going to become a player here in the drama momentarily. All right, so very briefly, we catch up on ships as they're about to put the Trento down, I think. There he goes. So there's our first ship lead of the game. As this Omaha is going to do something completely baffling, he's going to stop right here in the middle of this cap with two different battleships to shoot at him. So he's going to get two different racks of torpedoes. Now, the first rack I'm leading in the assumption of the hope that the Farragut is going to reverse back out here and blunder into them. But either way, the only way the Omaha can go right now to escape this torpedo salvo is forward. And if he goes forward, he's driving directly into the teeth of the battleship and the Almirante Cochrane behind me. And I'm okay with all of that. If he sits there, or he tries to reverse, he's going to get probably at least one, if not two torpedoes. And on his health pool, he cannot survive two torpedoes. RPF flips over very quickly, so that tells me the Farragut has, yep, he's looped around the backside of this island. He's left the Omaha to contest the cap. Omaha's going to eat a torp and some battleship shells, and he is right out. Back to a one-ship lead. Farragut is going to eat a pretty solid salvo there from the Duke of York, and his detection at disadvantage against me is continuing to be the bane of his existence. He's going to say something about it in chat, I think, before too long. He's going to smoke and back off the cap. Now, with him doing that, I realize the last big threat on the opposing team is this Poltava to the south. I'm going to get flipped around, and we're going to move down here to try to do something about this. Now, this Poltava is moving into at least a three, a two or three on one engagement, right? Now, I'm going to pause real briefly here, okay? Now, my range to the Poltava is about nine, nine kilometers? What does that say? Nine and a half or so. Now, ordinarily, that would be outside my torpedo range, right? But remember what we talked about? We talked about torpedo angles, okay? I'm firing those torpedoes downrange at the Poltava. And where he crosses inside my torpedo bubble, he has the possibility to blunder into their range. So where he is right now is not inside his range, not inside my torpedo range, but where he's going to be when the torpedoes might contact his hull on that course will be inside the torpedo range. So keep that in mind, right? We talked a little bit about that earlier, about kind of basic geometry and torpedo angles and torpedoes thinking through some of that. That's an example of that in action. Firing torpedoes at a ra at range, uh, at a ship who is out of the range of the fish that you're firing, but you have to account for where you think the impact point of those torpedoes is going to occur. And in that instance, it looked like it was going to occur inside the range of the actual fish. As it turns out, that Poltava's going to die long before those torpedoes arrive. The Duke of York has got shells on him. He's on triple fires. It turns out to be the Farragut that lands the killing blow there, but that's fine. He's out, and we've cleared up our backfield. So now, all that's left is the Farragut up in front of me. I caught a brief glimpse of him there for the Heinrich secondaries to kind of start going in on him. I'm actually going to pick him up again here in a moment. He's dead ahead of me. You can see the RPF. So we're going to try and get up here and pick him up again for the team. So they can try and continue to work, uh, get him off the board, and there he is again. So between me and this Heinrich, this Farragut's having a bad day. He cannot seem to escape both of us. I'm not really sure right now if I'm detecting him or the Heinrich is, but either way, he's got nowhere that he can hide. And you can see on the mat mini map, right, that last reporter of the Akatsuki is off to my right, but RPF is still in front of me. That tells me that I know, I know the Farragut is still the closest thing to me. He is going to catch a brief glimpse of me here. He's turning around, or at least turning to the east. I wandered just a hair too close, but as it happens, my team cleans him up right at the last possible second, and there we go. Torpedoes, direct front. All right. Activated. So now we're down to the Argentina and the Akatsuki, and it's a bit of mop-up time. 
You saw those the torpedo salvo going by on my starboard side there from the Akatsuki. RPF has him behind the island, moving north as it, as it changes sector there. That's not surprising to me. I could have potentially pushed around the north side of this island, but my main focus is really on the C cap. I want to go cap C, both for the XP gains and for the board control to kind of speed things up and hopefully keep the team uh, in the positive so that they can't find a way to lose a game that we should probably win at this stage. Akatsuki's pretty low, but I've only got two guns. He actually has way more barrels than I do. That guy has five guns on his hull, so it's not a gunfight that I'm excited about. But then again, neither is he on only 900 HP. He takes one shell, a few ticks of fire, immediately smokes, sneaks away on about 240 HP, and I can't spot him in there. Bummer. I'm going to leave him some torpedoes in the vain hope, frankly, that he'll blunder into them, but it's not going to happen, I'll tell you right now. He is going to end up camping in that smoke, and you'll see my RPF continue to kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Relay that information to me as I push the C cap. Because again, my goal, whenever I'm playing a destroyer, my goal is the win. All right? I could chase this guy down and smoke and kill him with a single shell, and we'd probably still win the game. But I would rather get over here, get the board control, make sure that we win just in case he lands lucky torpedoes. Maybe if I charge him in smoke, I blunder into a torpedo, right? Point blank engagements in Japanese destroyers, any destroyer really, but in Japanese destroyers in particular, can go catastrophically wrong if you're not careful. Just and you see there the Heinrich bagging, bagging a kill. I'm sorry, the Heinrich going down, the opposing Argentina bagging a kill. So it's kind of like, you know, this is expressly why I came over here to pick up the cap to try and make sure that we get this win. And sure enough, the Almirante Cocker's Hydro and everything they pick him up, and he is out. Yeah, Cocker actually gets a secondary kill, believe it or not. So now this is this game's basically over. We'll go ahead and uh, speed it up a bit here. But the bottom line is is that uh, this is um, we are we are all done, right? We now own all the caps. We're going to speed through the end here. Uh, the Argentina is going to come back and get in a little bit of a fight with the Cochrane. I'm going to put one last torpedo salvo out again in sort of the vain hope that I'm going to land something. But in reality, it's not going to happen, and that is the game. For a Tier 5 ship, a bottom tier Tier 5 destroyer, in that instance, I am pretty happy with that game result. Three kills, almost all of them coming in the opening minutes of the match. The quick double strike on the opposing Minikaze and uh, depth charging the submarine. I basically am responsible for all of the damage on the submarine, I think. Let's have a quick peek. 1,800 base XP. Again, for a Tier 5 destroyer, I'm perfectly happy with the result. I outscored all of the Tier 7s on my team. That tells you how impactful the spotting damage and the destroyer hunting and all of that can, can, can be uh, when you play one of these boats. Uh, let's see. Where's the Undine? All right, so somebody else got a little bit of damage on the Undine, but I got a, I got a huge chunk of that guy, right? Um, I had one little dinky shell on the Minikaze. I basically stole that kill, I think, from the Exeter. That guy was going to burn out anyway. Um, we did get um, that one torpedo into the Omaha that pr just barely preceded his death. And then, of course, we had the other two big hits on the Hiei that actually did pick up that kill. Only 26,000 spotting damage and, uh, and about 40,000 actual damage but you combine all of that together, and that's an 1800 base XP game with the double strike. I'm pretty happy. Like, you can't, you can't argue this for a mid-tier destroyer. That's pretty solid. So it gives you an idea of kind of what you're getting into with the rest of the line, right? You don't want to be courting gunfights. Torpedoes are your main focus. Um, but when you're pushed into it and you absolutely have to defend yourself with your guns, you have the capability to do that. Maybe not on Mutsuki here, but certainly as we go up the line, you're going to see that become more and more common. And we're going to talk more about that as we get to Fubuki and beyond. All right, welcome back, guys. I hope you enjoyed our sample game in Tier 5 Japanese Destroyer Mutsuki. I certainly enjoyed that game. It highlighted, I think, some of the capabilities of this ship that I had forgotten about or that I had um, mis misunderestimated <laughs> in the years since I had spent time playing it in the tech tree. I think there's actually a lot here to like, um, and I hope, I hope you'll spend a little time in the ship. Um, and, and share with me some of your, uh, your own experiences. I'm genuinely curious to see how you guys, you guys do with it. Um, I tell you what, I I'll start something new this, this series, guys. If you, if you watch this video and you, 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 you feel like you're learning something, you go out, you play one, you play the ship, you have a pretty good game. Ping me on Twitter, ping me on uh, discord, send me the replay. And maybe we'll start doing a little after action reports to, uh, to see, you know, how folks are doing. Uh, checking these things out, okay? I think that'd be a lot of fun. In the meantime, guys, wash your hands, be safe, and I'll catch you not catch you back here next time for our look at Tier 6 of Ibuki. Thanks. Take care.